Peter's not here, but I uh, I mark his memory and his extraordinary contribution to this community. He will be, I'm quite sure, pleased to think that critical theory is in the in the in the midst of its uh, renaissance here. So that's all good. Um, so let me start today with a a quotation from Edward Said, his book After the Last Sky, which is his memoir. <clears throat> he writes, it is inadequate only to affirm that a people was dispossessed, oppressed, or slaughtered, denied its rights and its political existence, without at the same time doing what Fanon did during the Algerian War, affiliating those horrors with the similar afflictions of other people. This does not mean a loss in historical specificity, but rather it guards against the possibility that a lesson learned about oppression in one place will be forgotten or violated in another place or time. That's, that's the end of my remarks for today. <laughs> I do rather feel that's all that needs to be said, but apparently it needs to be said again in some other ways. Um, it would be easier for me to broach this question of binationalism if, we're, if it were already widely discussed and we might call upon a shared understanding of its history and its impasses. My sense, however, is that this idea of binationalism, even though it's an older idea, has yet to be heard. Does binationalism mean that there should be two states, Palestine and Israel? Does it mean that there should be one state which includes equally two peoples? In short, what do we mean by binationalism in the context of Israel-Palestine, a place whose very name is already politically contested? Perhaps there are both one state and two state versions of binationalism, or perhaps binationalism describes a condition that is quite separate from state formation, even at odds with the notion of the nation state. I pose these questions not because I can or will answer them in this lecture, but rather to make uh, two more limited suggestions. First, that traditions of binational thought have been occluded by the changing history of the meaning of Zionism, even though binationalism aimed interestingly enough, an important strain of Zionist thinking throughout a good part of the 20th century. And secondly, following Edward Said, there can be no conceptualization of a workable binationalism within the ongoing terms of settler colonialism. This last seems crucial to consider in light of the debates about the one state solution for Netanyahu and others would very much like, we might, uh, say, a single state, Israel, which would include what they, invoking biblical claims, call Judea and Samaria. The building of the wall along the Palestinian border with Jordan seeks to materialize that very claim. That version of the one state solution would absorb Palestine into Israel, where, as we know, Palestinians would either remain second class citizens or have no recognizable citizenship, only perhaps residency papers. That version of the one state is very much in tension with another that would require equal rights of citizenship for all inhabitants of the land or those with legitimate claims to the land and the eradication of all laws and policies that legitimate, Ill, illegit, I'm sorry, that legitimate illegal land seizures, expulsions, colonial rule, and expansion. If the only way to guard against the first version of the one state solution is through the establishment of an independent Palestinian state, and so a two state solution, that would spell the end to binationalism, or would it? Binationalism also works in at least two ways. The increasing number of settlers in the West Bank with full rights of citizenship and on land illegally seized live in proximity with Palestinians who are living under occupation there. One could say that Israeli Jews and Palestinians live together there and that a certain version of binationalism holds. And yet, as long as those forms of proximate living rely upon ongoing forms of structural domination and dispossession, they cannot constitute a form of legitimate binationalism. 
even on those occasions where settlers and the colonized lived together without explicit violent conflict, they remain differentially saturated in power, organized by asymmetrical relations that are suffered and protested by those living under colonization. Such forms of coexistence, and I'm going to put that in quotation marks, which some cynically call peace, sorry, but it's been stolen as well. We can steal it back, okay? I'm not saying it's stolen for good, but it has been stolen. Um, do not qualify as forms of legitimate political binationalism since they continue colonial rule and as a result fail to incorporate principles of democratic equality. So before we commit ourselves to binationalism as such or to a one-state or two-state solution, let us be clear about what we mean by such a term, which versions we accept, which we oppose, and why. I have found that being able to work in two different directions at the same time is obligatory as one tries to think about the very form of relationality designated by by nationalism. To follow diverging and converging paths is not the same as vacillation, ambivalence, or contradiction. Rather, it is an effort to move beyond and against the limits of a single defining frame and a way of thinking time as unilinear to pursue instead an understanding of political complexity and its more promising dynamics. One can go back to the time in which binationalism was actively debated, or one could start uh, with the wretched forms of binationalism that have become part of the colonized condition. But in the end, it turns out to be obligatory to do both in order to understand what possible and effective notions of the binational are available to critical thought now. So starting off from one direction, I propose to address a version of binational thought that emerges within Jewish intellectual life, one that was actually a recognized part of Zionism for several decades, and which has disappeared from the semantic reach of political Zionism as we know it, re-emerging now, oddly enough, as an emblem of anti-Zionism. From another vantage point, I want to give some indication of why that historical notion of binationalism developed within Zionist thought proved to be inadequate. In short, even its best versions, in my view, did not adequately call into question Zionism as a settler colonial project. Nevertheless, I want to suggest that some aspects of that tradition of binationalism bear uh, important similarities to the late binational vision of Edward Said, or at least that these are views that can speak to one another, in effect of taking a comparative approach to binationalism, um, suggesting that this is one way to enact one of its possible trajectories at a theoretical level. Said clearly understood this resonance between his view of binationalism and the one formulated within early Zionist debates, but he also underscored the points of divergence between those views and his own. Let me give you two different examples that Said actually talked about early Zionist accounts of binationalism. Asked in an interview in 1993 whether his vision of inclusion and the one-state solution actually resonates with one of the old streams of Zionism, Said responded that he had read in the early traditions, including the early documents of Brit Shalom and the plans for federated authority proposed by Ehud, the political party Red pushed when Ben-Gurion came to power in 1948. Said continues, there were people of a fairly important caliber, quote, such as Martin Buber, Judah Magnus, who was the first president of Hebrew University, Hannah Arendt, and a few others who were not so well known. These are the international luminaries who realized that there was going to be a clash if the aggressive settlement policies and the unreflecting ignoring of the Arabs pressed ahead, end quote. And yet Said then makes clear that much of this discussion of binationalism within Zionism was part of a intra-Jewish debate taking place within the Zionist or Jewish camp, end quote. He continues, there were attempts to reach Palestinians, but the situation was overall so polarized, and the British were playing such a Machiavellian role, that is, in 1948, and the leadership of the Zionist community were also such clever politicians that these individuals, who in the end were individuals, really didn't have much of a chance, end quote. He then goes on to say, it was a rather restricted debate. I don't think one should overemphasize it, end quote. 
And yet, retelling that very same history a few years later, indeed in his essay entitled Truth and Reconciliation, um, Said reapproaches this history with a greater sense of hope. Let me cite this uh, discussion for you, and I quote, during the interwar period, a small but important group of Jewish thinkers, so it's almost the same lines, but it's a few years later and it matters. During the interwar period, a small but important group of Jewish thinkers, Judah Magnus, Buber, Arendt, and others, argued and agitated for a binational state. The logic of Zionism naturally overwhelmed their efforts, but the ideas alive today, here and there, among Jewish and Arab individuals, frustrated with the evident insufficiencies and depredations of the present. The essence of that vision is coexistence and sharing in ways that require an innovative, daring, and theoretical willingness to get beyond the arid stalemate of assertion and rejection. Once the initial acknowledgment of the other as an equal is made, I believe the way forward becomes not only possible, but attractive. Now this second quotation, which finds in the binationalist vision the possibility of an acknowledgment of the other as an equal, does not fully vitiate the first, but it opens up the question of how to think about associated terms like coexistence, cooperation, cohabitation, and even binationalism. What distinguishes the form of binationalism that Said is prone to accept is the reciprocal recognition of equality. A certain circularity emerges here that, in my view, cannot be avoided. It goes like this. One might say that the acknowledgment of the other as equal precedes the radical structural changes at the level of the state that are necessary for substantial forms of cohabitation or binationalism that we could call egalitarian. Or one might say, start from the other direction. <coughs> Only once those structural changes are made, including the end to settler colonialism and the establishment of a constitution that provides protections for all inhabitants of those with rightful claims to the land, will acknowledgment of equality become possible. So I said I was going to start by looking at two different directions. <laughs> I suggested to you it's not exactly a vacillation, but it is a significant dilemma. At stake is the difference between models of coexistence that assume continuing colonization and others, the realization of which presume the end of colonization. What's most important at this juncture is Said's insistence repeated in Freud in the Non-European 2003 that the Jewish tradition includes an experience of diaspora that is crucial for the project of political equality in Palestine. What is that relation between diaspora and political equality. At various points in his career of political writing, Said makes a significant distinction between a self-segregating trend in Jewish life and a diasporic one. As early as 1968, in his essay, The Palestinian Experience, Said marks the triumph of the former, former tendency within Zionism, one that, I quote, overrode it, its own moderates in establishing a form of nationalist segregation that refuses any counterclaim to territory or political rights of self-determination. So a counterclaim coming from Palestinian inhabitants. Um, <clears throat> and then within parentheses, interestingly enough, he adds, <laughs> her ends, it cannot fail to escape the Palestinians' notice, by the way, how much their experience begins to resemble that of the diaspora Jew." End quote, end parents. This is real, could die in a parenthesis, you know, you know, lots of things can happen. Okay, we should, we should not take the parenthesis as something he doesn't really mean, it's rather sotto voce. You know, what do I do with that? Notice this, what do I do with this? And then again, in After the Last Sky, his memoir published in 1986, he writes, I do not like to call it a Palestinian diaspora. There's only an apparent symmetry between our exile and theirs. Besides, the diaspora no longer exists spiritually and culturally as it once did in Central Europe with tragic figures like Kafka, Schoenberg, and Benjamin at its core. Today's dias diaspora is represented centrally by American Zionism, a far different phenomenon 
I find it much easier to debate with an Israeli than an American Jew, end quote. Later in Freud and the non-European, he will draw implications from this resemblance, emphasizing the unhoused and diasporic character of Jewish life that aligns it in our vast age of population transfers with refugees, exiles, expatriates, and immigrants. He proposes again that this diasporic character of Jewish life is intentionally itself segregating tradition. And in some of his work on binationalism, he refers to Israel and Palestine as two peoples irrevocably bound together. And in that context, he suggests as well, and I quote, Israel and Palestine are parts rather than antagonists of each other's history and underlying reality. Said knows full well that these are distinctly different histories of displacement and that there is no absolute structural analogy to be drawn between them. After all, it's most often the case the displacement of the Jews which led to the establishment of Israel was the cause of the dispossession of the Palestinians. Can there still be a way of pursuing the analogy without forgetting the causation here? And what sensibility, what practice of translation is required for such a task? Perhaps we would need to turn to Kanafani's return to Haifa, something I hope to do in the future. The establishment of Israel as a sanctuary for European Jewish refugees produced a new refugee problem, that of the Palestinians, which means that a refugee problem continues to be reproduced in the 20th century up until the present. A comparative approach to the refugee problem, Said was importantly a professor of comparative literature, a field that fosters the recognition of uneasy or unexpected parallels between different texts and contexts, or which regularly undergoes shifts in frame, okay. becomes possible, this becomes possible, the comparative approach to the refugee problem, only when the vision is widened to include several instances. Arendt's approach in, in um, her book on totalitarianism is one. In drawing the analogy between Jews and Palestinians, significantly distinct from any analogy between Israelis and Palestinians, Said is seeking to widen the lens on the refugee problem, mobilizing the potential for a diasporic understanding between those in the diaspora or whose diasporic past continues to inform their ethical and political sensibility. Diaspora is not foregrounded as the aim or goal of politics, nor could it possibly describe a fixed location. It's rather proposed as a critical perspective on forms of political nationalism that have required repeated expulsion of those perceived as non-nationals, and in the case of Zionism, those who, um, uh, those within the Zionist perspective who favor expulsion are understood as self-segregating, continuing a form of settler colonialism that is bound up with the historical and ongoing dispossession of Palestinians from their homes um, and the building of dwelling structures on those appropriated lands, such as uh, was uh, briefly uh, empowered by the Prower Plan, which sought to destroy the homes of 60,000 Bedouins that is, met Palestinians who live in the Negev and forcing them to leave. It's only been partially successful because of, of a very successful resistance. Political forms of binationalism either presume that the social or ethical grounds for cohabitation is possible, or think that the political form can gradually produce the ethos that makes its implementation possible and sustainable, citing post-apartheid modes of coexistence in South Africa, or state formation in post-war Bosnia-Herzegovina. Said is not being naive about the possibilities of cohabitation or coexistence. His formulation suggests only that what he calls processes of identity enforcement, that these processes of identity enforcement, having one's identity enforced over and against another, are challenged and heightened when forms of nationalism are put in check, and that another understanding can emerge, one that draws upon and elaborates a diasporic sensibility drawn from different histories and anticipated by new political forms. Now, there are many skeptical questions that attend any suggestion of this kind. 
First, that the reason for the analogy between Palestinians and Jews is traced to the fact that